Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. First, I just want to thank everyone for coming to this session. And we have a very special session here today with our three speakers, uh, Dr. Michael Helmrath, Dr. Danny Dimitriou, and Dr. Kay Lund. I will, in the interest of time, um, let them give uh, further introductions. You'll be taken through their career paths and also their life paths. But I want to emphasize that this is intended to be a very interactive session, and it's a rare opportunity to have an open discussion with our speakers. They really welcome your questions and welcome the opportunity to share their advice and their experiences with you. Um, so I hope you'll get a lot out of this session and have the opportunity to discuss some things that you might not get to discuss very often. Also, I would like to note that the session is stated to end at noon in the program, but we will be going until 12.30 today, and the next event will be our residency luncheon. That begins at 12.30. So with that, we will go ahead and get started. So thank you very much. Is this working? Yes, it is. Uh, so I've enjoyed this morning actually sitting in the room thinking back to where I was when you guys were uh, where you are right now, frankly, in training. Um, uh, and I think this is a wonderful opportunity to discuss things. Uh, we only have five minutes to kind of give you a background, and I just want to kind of hit on some points. Uh, as you can see, I'm a pediatric surgeon um, with various roles at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, so this includes running uh, the research there, but also a lot of translational uh, programs I run. I am the head of the bariatric and intestinal failure program um, and uh, starting a new uh, uh, venture called Custom that I will uh, end with briefly. Um, when I look back at my career and when I give talks now to different hospitals trying to set up research programs, I always use this slide because I feel as an MD that takes care of patients that the, one of the success reasons I've been able to do what I've done is because I build what I do around the common themes of, for me, intestinal failure, GI problems. And that I recognize that although I come from a very basic science background, that integrating all these different aspects into the programs that I live with daily have really enabled me to grow and develop things which I'm passionate about, which is caring for babies with GI problems. And that's really what drove me to do what I want to do. So we'll come back to this in a second. So, I have a timeline on the bottom, and at 2002, I finished my training that included a master's, seven years of clinical pediatric surgery and general surgery training, and two years of research set into that point. And in 2002, what I was able to do is see one of these babies as a patient, and I was able to operate on that baby. So you're very highly trained when you finish your clinical training to be able to directly take what you've learned and take care of that patient's problem. But you're not ready to develop a program. You don't know how to do that. You don't know how to integrate what you see within an institution. And if you're going to do science like we all want to do, you have to look at that from what perspective do you have. And if you look at these different diseases, they're very different. And people may study different diseases, but what you recognize is commonality. And if you want to study things, the commonality for me was these are newborns where their guts are rapidly developing with other insults that may have immunological, inflammatory, or congenital problems to it, how am I going to solve those problems? So um, for me, back in the lab, you start with an animal model. That's what's ready, and that's what you're capable of doing. Well, all animal models have strengths and weaknesses. And as a clinician, you should understand where your model lacks. So for me, operating on an adult mouse is not a baby, but it's what I had to do. A mouse is different than a human. Now, when I finished my training, I really looked at it as a postdoc when I was starting my, my basic science labs. And I started trying to bring in people in my world that were much broader than surgery. I met Kay Lund at a point within a few years, challenging me to change my model from a small bowel section to what was more clinically relevant. Uh, for various reasons, it, it just made more sense. And from that model, I started to see things that I saw clinically. A dilated bowel after resection is what I see clinically. And it started to make me think about why that's happening, and it really got me into the field of stem cells. And at the same time, 
I'm a surgeon, and I did a lot of laparoscopic surgery, and so I had access to patients that the GI people were sending me, and I started doing bariatric surgery because I was capable of doing it. We put together a program, and that was really my first ability to do multidisciplinary programs, and I started writing grants that weren't basic science. And frankly, I had no skill set on how to do a multi-institutional trial collecting data, which is very different than bench work. We got funded in the NIH in 2006 with a project called Teen Labs, which we're still funded on today. And really, it's trained me along the way a whole different set of skills that I did not have. Um, and it really has enabled me to take a lot of my insights and start developing trials in my patients in the hospitals that I am now doing commonly. So the point being that you don't finish your training having all the tools. You, you continue to be trained along the way. And this has been very helpful for me. But back to stem cells. So, you know, my passion is the gut, and I needed to understand stem cells, and frankly, when I started, the tools were not as good as they are today, and the ability to take a cell and culture it was a great advance in our field. I moved to UNC, frankly, to be around scientists that understood this, and they opened the world to me when I got into consortiums, and I started to recognize that I bring something different to the table than they do, and if I collaborate, I really can move things ahead. Well, as a surgeon, I have free access to human tissue on a daily basis. And, and so we really pushed the protocols to try to humanize what we were doing. And, and basically, by the time I left UNC to, to Cincinnati, I was capable of doing things very few labs were able to do. And what that meant was that I brought something to the table where I could collaborate with different people, and it opened doors. And, and frankly, from that, um, we started to do uh, more cultures. But the thing that drove me the most crazy was that I wanted an in vivo model because I wanted to study the biology of the gut following insult damage response, which doesn't occur in a dish. And those inneroid cultures just would not transplant. So I would say one of the key points of success is learning how to fail. And that agony of defeat is how I felt every time I tried to transplant models back because there wasn't a niche that supported engraftment. But I was keen enough to understand not to just bash on the same problem, but to look for alternative solutions, which for me became IPS cells. The generation of an IPS cell has a unique niche that allows transplantation. And with that advent, opened a whole door to being able to study things in very different ways. And it gave me opportunities to expand what I was doing to different consortiums. Uh, and has been very helpful, and my lab has continued to collaborate and, and has fostered an environment where I feel like I'm driving that ship forward. So, so back to this, this thing. What did I do? What have I done? Well, I've been out since 2002, so what are we at now? 16 years? And my lab is really about halfway through my career is where I see it, and I'm an enabler. I cut a lot of red tape. I bring very translational questions to the postdocs, MD, PhD students in my lab that drive things forward. But I also integrate other aspects of care that drives this program forward and, and have been able to really build what I really think are very uh, interesting and really, I think, state-of-the-art clinical programs uh, for intestinal failure, for bariatrics, and stem cells. But my perspective has changed and that I keep being presented new challenges. And now that we're capable of taking stem cells and growing all these different organs, we recognize the power of that in medicine. And the ability of that is really needs to be enabled beyond an individual lab. So at Cincinnati, we formed a, a group of four of us formed something called Custom, which now involves over 20 different researchers. And we're all looking to generate IPS tissues in our lab, but we're also looking to do this in a way that translates beyond our organs, uh, from the, not just the gut, but the heart, the bone marrow, the enteric nervous system, the brain. And recognizing common areas being done in a common space really will enable that both within the institution, but with NUCO, pharma, and other things that are always approaching us on a daily basis. And so where I've in my career avoided administrative jobs that I didn't like, opportunities continue to present themselves, and you meet those because you learn and you adapt. And ultimately, in my career, I want to take tissue and grow it and put it in a human to solve a condition. 
and without understanding the broader way of doing this and having institutional support, but outside pharma and large um, NUCO support, you're not going to get there. I never was told that. I've learned that along the way. So in the end, uh, I just wanted to give that brief overview. Um, I have a great uh, lab full of uh, many young uh, students like you, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to share my experience with you. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, thank you for coming to this session, and thank you for having me here um, at a pretty early stage in my career. So I'll be kind of going through the whole process, but um, just to give you the final slide, I am currently in year five out of five out of a custom tailored um, residency slash fellowship. Okay. Still hear me? Okay. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about resilience and physician scientist training, um, aka obsessive passion for science, because that's really what you need, and that's going to be the take home message. So, my story starts in a little town um, about an hour south of Stockholm in Sweden. But even though I was in a tiny little town with only one high school, I did have a very big dream. And my dream was to study the mind body relationship in relation to health. And this was back in the 1990s. <clears throat> And uh, back then, especially in Europe, um, really what you always knew you were going to do is become a physician. There wasn't a lot of science, especially in a small town, for me to really be exposed to. And also in Sweden, you, start, you go to medical school right after high school. So I applied to medical school, um, but I did not get in. Um, and I had to make a decision, and I did not want my dream to um, go to waste. And so I flew literally all the way across the world um, from Sweden to Hawaii, where I began my undergraduate pre-medical studies at Hawaii Pacific University. Also did some really cool research, beginning to explore the mind-body connection at the cancer center um, on breast cancer patients. And then, um, because I wanted a little bit more of an academic experience, I transferred midway through to uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, where I um, did lots of extracurricular activities, including um, a lot of research. I got a great GPA. I got highest honors. So I figured this is a good time to apply. And because I now had learned about the MD-PhD program, naturally, this was the place for me to, um, to move on to. And I got really good interviews at all the top places, but guess what? I did not get in. So you're starting to kind of notice the pattern of the resilience building, right? Um, and I didn't get in, I was told by my very good mentors, because of the following. I was actually talking about my, my big dream, my mind-body connection and, and health. And so I'm going to read to you a quote from my application back then in the early 2000s. The long-term goal of my research would be to find the specific extended neural events that lead to various healing processes, for example, a firing pattern that ends in the activation of insulin-producing cells. If we can then learn to reproduce this firing pattern, we would be able to treat certain diabetic patients in a whole new and safer way with the power of their own minds. Other potential applications include areas such as pain relief, adjunctive cancer treatment, and depression. And one of, I remember very well one of the interviews at an Ivy League school, um, I, was, I was sitting down with the MD-PhD director who told me that he really does not understand what I'm doing applying for an MD-PhD program because clearly my interest would be much better suited in a psychology program. So I decided that could not be the end of my story. And so I flew across the country from Santa Barbara to New York where I did a pre-doc with Dr. Rafael Eusta at Columbia University. And I was really studying at the bottom up. I really wanted to understand how basic neuronal activity is organized in the brain. And I was doing slice physiology and published a great paper. Um, so I decided, OK, it's time to try again. And this time, I did get into the MD-PhD program at Mount Sinai, where I spent the next nine years doing incredibly cool stuff. And I started there. Um, by the, there was not really any researcher that was doing this mind-body stuff. Um, and so I studied, I, I 
um, decided to really continue down the path of basic building blocks of neurobiology. And I joined the lab of Dr. Chung Zhu, um, patching onto cells um, in slice and then um, doing really state-of-the-art um, live uh, two-photon microscopy of synaptogenesis. But guess what happened? Two years into my um, uh, training in his lab, he left academia, lured by the industry, and I was stranded because the two-photon microscope was no longer there. Luckily, I was able to kind of very subtly shift um, to Dr. John Morrison's lab, and I, was continu I continued to do synaptogenesis, but this time in vitro. Um, and somehow, in about a year and a half, managed to publish a lot of papers. But more importantly, during this time, this guy came to Mount Sinai. And this is the great Dr. Eric Nestler. And if you've had any affiliation to neuroscience, you know who he is. He was the president of the Society for Neuroscience last year. And he brought with him a newly um, validated model in his lab of stress, which included, um, which was really the first time that, that um, was a new a model that allowed for dividing animals into susceptible and resilient. So now I finally had the opportunity to start doing some really cool stuff, but I was going back into third year of medical school. So I approached Dr. Nestler and I asked him, can I do a mini postdoc with you while I go back to third year? Which he said is clearly crazy, right? But I convinced him because he is a physician scientist himself and somehow I was able, actually able to do quite a bit of science during that time including getting a first authorship in his lab, and really learn this model. So over the nine years that I was in the MD-PhD program, I had a phenomenal time. I published a lot. I got an NRSA. Um, but most importantly, right at the end, I had started to work on this dream of mine, the mind-body connection. And now I was faced with um, you know, going into uh, residency, and the, I was faced with the leaky pipeline that, that we often talk about which is really what the purpose of this discussion is, right? Many, many MD-PhD students do not end up actually getting back into basic science. And I was scared of that, especially given the fact that I was finally working on what I wanted to do. So I decided to take matters into my own hand. And I decided to custom tailored my own program. So I approached the three department chairs of, uh, general pedi of pediatrics, environmental health, and neuroscience with this crazy proposal. Basically, I asked them to custom tailor my residency and allow me to do research during that time um, independently. And what we came up with was um, an extend, uh, we combined the three-year residency with uh, a two-year fellowship, and um, we extended the residency clerkships from three years to four years, basically allowing me to go 50-50 in terms of research um, for the, uh, after the internship year. Um, the fellowship was integrated, it was a separate project, and then basically they gave me a tiny little startup. They gave me a bench, they gave me $20,000 and money for a research assistant, which um, for any of you that are kind of computing in terms of numbers is too little. But um, in year one, I was able to, instead of a research assistant, recruit a graduate student who was very, very motivated. I was able to write a NARSAD Young Investigator Award and secure that. <clears throat> in year two, using that NARSAD Award, um, I was able to gather preliminary data with my graduate student, and um, I wrote a mock R01. In year three, um, I felt that I had not quite enough data, but I thought I should submit, and so I, should, I submitted an R01. Um, and it was scored, but not funded. And in year four, I was able to resubmit that R01 and now get funded, and my funding just started last September. Um, and now I'm in year five. I am really focusing a lot, in, aside from my own research on environmental health, um, my environmental health uh, project, and on applying for jobs. But most importantly, during the last couple of years, study, using this model of social defeat and this model of resilience and susceptibility, I've identified an actual neural pathway involved in susceptibility and resilience. And by changing the neural activity using chemogenetics, to mimic the activation pattern in resilient animals, I've actually been able to turn susceptible brains into resilient brains, both at the level of neuronal activation as well as at the level of behavior. And so basically, uh, almost 20 years later, I'm finally working on what I actually promised I would do um, in the early 2000s. Um, and as a final thought, I just want to give you a little bit um, of data on the importance of mentors, which I know is a recurrent theme at, at this meeting. 
as well as the two-body problem. And I've quantified this because I know we're all nerds in here. And so um, when I started applying for jobs in the fall, um, I decided to sort of take three different approaches. For the really top six schools that I really wanted to, to not have, uh, not miss my opportunity at, I decided to ask Dr. Eric Nessler to email on my behalf to the chairs of, of, at those universities. So that was six programs. For nine programs, I emailed the same exact application, but in my name, with my email address. And then for eight programs, because my husband is also a physician scientist and he is also finishing a residency in radiation oncology this summer, we decided to email together jointly. So we literally co-wrote to pediatrics and radiation oncology saying we are a couple, we're super cool, I have an R1, he's got like 20 papers, you know, can, do you want to interview us? And this is what happened. Um, the importance of mentors is clearly laid out here. The response rate when Dr. Eric Nessler emailed somebody was 100%, as opposed to approximately 33% when I emailed or when my husband and I emailed together. And this is what happens in terms of interview rate. Clearly, the importance of mentorship is evident at the level of actually receiving an interview um, because I got twice as many when he had initially emailed. And, oh, I must have not put that last bar. Just kidding, there is no bar in that last <laughs> part because my husband and I, when we, when we wrote together, did not get any interviews whatsoever. Um, so the take home points, um, if you can do anything else with your life, please do it and please do it soon because this is a really, really tough um, uh, road that you're embarking on. Um, but if you are going to stay in this career, you have to learn how to take punches. I cannot emphasize this enough. I'm not talking about the punches here, but really there's a lot of punches throughout the years. The only difference between success and failure is that success, successful people fail more. This is universally true. If you don't fail 90% of the time, you're not trying hard enough. And if you are trying hard enough, obsessive passion does pay off. And finally, find good mentors and ask them to make calls on your behalf. Um, so with that, I want to thank the many, many people, primarily volunteers who rotated through my lab at various points and helped me gather a lot of this data, but primarily the, the graduate student that started with me at the beginning, um, Dr. Yael Grossman, she's now finished and she actually moved on to a postdoc with this guy, who incidentally is Kafui Jirasa, who is the first person to have gone an R01 in residency. And incidentally, also studies resilience. Starting to see a pattern here? <laughs> And this is what happens when you go from no money to an R01. Um, this is my lab approximately three months after my R01 kicked in. And we now even have our own logo. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And this is my email address. Please feel free to email me with any questions. Uh, so uh, thank you for that. This, these are great talks. Uh, so I'm going to give maybe a slightly different talk. I'm going to talk about my career path, challenges, rewards, and lessons learned, which I hope will be helpful. And really, this shows my grandfather, who told me when I was eight years old, you should be a professor. And so I decided to take him seriously. And then there's been this path to NIH. So um, I went, I was the first generation to go to college. I grew up in an extremely disadvantaged town in the UK, a mining town. Um, I did both a bachelor's degree and a PhD at the University of Newcastle upon Tyne, even though I had an opportunity to go to some higher end universities, at least for the PhD. The most important part of the PhD was our lab was completely under resourced, and so I was asked to set up a clinical gastrin radioimmunoassay at the time to try and set up a diagnosis for peptic ulcer disease or Zollinger Ellison syndrome, gastrin producing tumors. That was sort of bad because we didn't have a lot of resources, but what was really good about it is it started off my life daily interacting with MDs, talking about the results of these assays. The other thing about the UK system is if you go to a PhD, you've got to teach. You're not allowed to spend all your time doing research. You teach. Um, 
and it was a lot. I mean, I was teaching labs to medical students. The best thing about that was I actually learned how to teach way, way before I was even thinking about being an academic. I had a mentor who said, if you get a good result, do everything you can to prove it wrong. And if it pans out, you're onto something. I think that's really some, uh, something we should all think about uh, for research, uh, because we can, if we don't do the right controls, if we don't do the right uh, statistical analysis, there's a problem. I initially got accepted into going to Global's lab in Rockefeller, but I didn't get any money to get me there. And then I applied for many fellowships uh, to take me from the UK to the US, and I got them all. Um, I was accepted into the molecular endocrinology, Howard Hughes Medical Institute lab, and this was right at the point where the moratorium on recombinant DNA technology was lifted. Um, I was the only female of, uh, and only one of two PhDs in a very, very large lab. Um, my project at that point was to try and clone gastrin and figure out why there were different molecular forms. So what were the challenges? I was 24 years old, I didn't know a soul in the US, and I was walking into a lab, I hadn't even met the mentor. Um, I knew no biochemistry, so the first lab meeting, I actually turned around to one of my colleagues and said, where is this library, this cDNA library located in Boston? <laughs> and at that point, they told me, okay, you need to learn some biochemistry. Um, then, two weeks after I arrived, my gastrin project was done. So PNAS paper came out, and it was, what am I going to do? New project. What were the rewards? Incredible to be in Boston at that time. New technology and great resources. I switched projects to cloning glucagon, and this led to the discovery of glucagon light -like peptide 1, which is now a blockbuster di diabetes treatment. Um, I got a career development award. It was very productive, and I had multiple job offers, including to stay at Harvard and Mass General. So lessons, as long as you know how to learn, you can take on a new field fast. Um, I, def I definitely would like to see the U US system have less coursework uh, during the PhD in particular. Formal courses are not essential, and we can talk about this maybe during the discussion. Really important, <coughs> especially when you're in a lab, a new lab, uh, to be sure you get the credit and you know how to ask for the credit for the things you actually did. So then what next? I was offered these jobs and I did something that, again, was not very popular. I accepted a job at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, which then was considered a tier two university, even though it was the oldest state university in the country. It's now one of the top funded universities in the US. Um, I had my first R01 on looking at the biological roles of glucagon light -like peptide 1 and glucagon light -like peptide 2, because both of those are in the glucagon gene. Um, and then I had a career that spanned many, many things. I had a, the science family, tons of students, postdocs, actually everybody who wrote a K award from my lab actually got it. I think everybody who wrote an F award got it. Um, one of the most important things was I had a stay-at-home dad, who's shown here. Um, and on my second date with him, this was in England, he said to me, I've always wanted to do the John Lennon thing um, and actually stay at home and look after the kids. And I went, bingo, that's exactly what I need. <laughs> and, uh, I have to say, uh, there are the two daughters. One's uh, actually got getting out of residency straight into a faculty position. The other one is a, a high school science teacher, and they're both married to residents. So you can see how I care about residents and resilience. Um, I had a lot of peer review experience and editorial experience. So, what were the challenges and rewards? My first R01, I chose exactly the opposite wrong roles for GLP-1 and GLP-2. Uh, so, I put in my renewal, and of course, I had no productivity. I got an okay score, but it wasn't fundable. And I was so clueless about the NIH process, I didn't know that I could resubmit. So I went ahead. So one of the lessons here is you've got to know the NIH process. Um, then I submitted an, two new R01s, and I got both of them. And this really started a career in IGFs. Uh, another challenge was I stayed a long, long time at Chapel Hill. It was extremely rewarding. I went and looked at a lot of different jobs, chairs, deans, positions. And I could just never make that decision uh, to go. What were the rewards, huge rewards of teaching and mentoring? Um, this, I really was involved in the growth of a, an incredible public university and its research. One of the things I did while I was there was work with the vice dean for research on the advancement of women. We got paid family leave for physicians as well as basic science in academia. 
Um, I was in multiple departments, physiology, pediatrics, nutrition, GI division, neuroscience centers, good and bad about that. So it was great for cross-discipline science, but it was a lot of work and great mentors and colleagues that I'll talk about. But the lessons learned, it's really essential uh, to know the rules and the processes about NIH funding. I do a lot of uh, talking about that at different venues. Um, critical input on grants is essential before submission. That second grant that I wrote, I took to a mentor I'll talk about in a couple of minutes, and I'd written the whole thing before I showed it to him. And he said, Kay, you know, what are you trying to say here? And so I told him, and he said, would you go away and write that because you speak a lot better than you write? And I was really upset. You know, I did a bad job on my grant, but it was the best advice I got. Stay at home dad is really important. It is important even if you don't move to look at other jobs because then at least you know what's out there. My family gave up. It was touch, tough to leave research, teaching, and mentoring. And then, uh, first the mentor. Um, this was Judd Van Wyck. Uh, he was the father of pediatric endocrinology. He treated science like a kid with ice cream. And the most important part in this was, again, something I learned from him. He cared much more about his trainees than he cared about himself. And that really set the standard for me in terms of how I treated people. But his favorite quote was, if you're appointed to a committee, don't show up so they won't ask you to be on the committee. Um, and he, he, he would actually be appalled if he knew what my uh, committee responsibility was now. Other mentors, Don Powell, he was the guy who told me I um, spoke better than I wrote. Bob Sandler, uh, chief of the GI division. Etta, who I worked with in terms of family leave and many things in advancement of women. And, and Michael, who has been a key uh, colleague for many years now. So finally, I did something that I never knew I would do. I applied for this director of the Division of Biomedical Research at, U at uh, NIH. Um, and it was really because I'd been on study section. I cared about early stage investigators. I really want to see you all in this room want to actually carry on doing research and succeed. Uh, I wanted to join the national conversation, so we are trying to get stipend increase. We've instituted a new research in residency program an institutional one that we could talk about in the discussion, uh, enhancing diversity and, and matching training to the career paths. At the bottom here, I provide two links. Uh, if you go there to a training website or to the diversity website, this probably gives you more information than you ever wanted to know, but it tells you everything about K awards, training pathways, potential programs. So it's, it's a rich resource. So finally, I just wanted to say a couple of things. <clears throat> One of the things that I've learned since I was at NIH is we focus too much on this hyper-competitive environment and not on the rewards of science. So everybody in this room has done science. They've overcome barriers, challenges. And if you really care about science, it's worth doing. <clears throat> the second is academia isn't easy. Nobody should tell you that it's a, a simple thing to stay in business there. But it's really rewarding. And you can have flexibility there that you cannot have in other positions. For me, the mentees, I, I go around and I meet. There's, n there's not a city I go to where I can't meet one of my former trainees. And this is wonderful. Um, and then the last thing, which is a hard sell, and I try this a lot. Even if you write a grant and it doesn't get funded, you've got something from that. That's your work. That's your project. You did it. It's a product. There's actually two evaluations in my division that show just writing a fellowship application or a K award actually have an impact on future success. So you, you immerse yourself in the topic. My kids could never get hold of me when I was writing a grant. Um, and focus more on the science than the dollars. I think that's a, a really important message to learn and not be so worried that you're not going to make it. And with that, I'll stop and hope we can have a lively discussion from here. Thank you. Thank all of you so much for wonderful discussions. And now I will open up for questions from our audience. Please feel free to use the, the microphone in the middle. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to ask a question related to something that I think I've had to be the most resilient about. So um, I've personally dealt with depression. And although I'm like past that, that the worst parts of it, it does inform a lot of why I want to do an MD-PhD, because I think that in treating neuropsychiatric illness, basic science training is going to be 
really necessary because of how much more we have to learn about them. And so obviously I want to reflect that in my application because it's a huge motivator for me, but it is something that I have fear about, like being seen as though I couldn't like handle the, the rigor of the program or like I would be less capable of dealing with the stress that comes along with the program um, by like outing myself as someone who struggles with depression from the beginning. First of all, thank you so much. First of all, thank you so much for your candor. This is such an important conversation that I think we need to have much, much more of. And I think we're starting as a country and as a community in terms of science and medicine to have more and more of these conversations. We've actually very tragically had a couple of suicides in New York, a couple of different institutions. and. And um, it's a big deal, and I'm so happy to actually hear somebody openly talk about that. Um, having said that, I would not put that on, on any applications quite yet. You know, I think, I think there still is, I think it's still a hard thing to put in writing. And I think the important, um, the important outlet for that should be really good mentors, um, really good friendships. Um, and, and trying to do it sort of at that level uh, without making it into your sort of official paperwork. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of my suggestion. So, so from my perspective, I think the, uh, the, I would look at it as a positive in that you were able to overcome and get a grip. The fact you can stand up is a great sign of success. If you're applying for a residency, it doesn't really belong there. It's just resilient. You can speak between the words. Um, but as you mature, um, that will be part of your conversation, um, and it will be part of you. Um, you just have to be um, cognizant of who's reading your letter. But um, the greatest sign of successful people are ones who have overcome great challenges, and it, you have that story. So don't, don't be too scared to discuss it. But I, I would agree with Danny. I, if you're applying, I'm assuming you're applying for residencies. It's, or, for which one? For the MD PhD program. So um, again, they're looking for people who are going to be able to perform. Um, uh, maybe not in that stat. As your career develops, that story will develop. But early on, I would avoid it because when you're looking at letters, I don't think it'll distinguish you yet. But it will at one point, I guarantee it. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with the solution-oriented component of it. You, you don't want to go into the problem and not the solution. I think it might be all, also really important to be sure of the mentors who are going to write your references um, that th they're going to go in a solution-oriented manner as well. Hi, thank you for these uh, great presentations. Um, my question is not necessarily that much related to resilience, but I saw in several of your career paths, and Dr. Lund specifically mentioned that going to UNC was not, maybe at that point not the most popular decision. So um, I'm at a school in uh, Charleston, South Carolina that's technically a little bit you know, you're smaller. And so I was wondering what your experiences have been of going to a bigger, you know, more fancy institutions and and how that you know helps with your career or or because uh, maybe the resilience is you have to have it a little more if you're at a smaller place so are you at musc correct yeah so you know i think what you have to do is ask what it is you want to get out of a particular experience that you're having musc has a, a huge amount of strengths Mm -hmm. um, and if that's a place that is going to work for you, um, that will work. The second is if you're going to look elsewhere to go on to the next step, really important to be sure that you talk to the right mentors. Uh, we, we heard from Danny here, having a mentor make a phone call for you, um, having mentors who can write good references for you and talk about your strengths is, is, is really important. But I would really think about what it is you want to do Mm -hmm. And does a particular institution have the people, the resources, the research enterprise that will fit your goals? And I wouldn't worry too much mm -hmm. about, um, you know, where it ranks in terms of, of, of the funding situation. It's, is it the right fit for you, the right people, the right research? 
Um, I, I, I totally agree. And, you know, I, it, it's on right um, you know, I pointed out the fact that when I first applied and didn't get in, I, I got all the top interviews. Um, and I was very upset <laughs> when I didn't get in um, and later got into just Mount Sinai. Um, but there's a couple of things that were incredibly serendipitous about that. One is that neuroscience at the time at Mount Sinai was almost non-existent, and now I'm in one of the top you know, 10 places in the country. So I've gotten to watch this growth in terms of neuroscience, which, um, you know, if you're already at the top, you can't really go too much higher, and the only direction that you go is sort of down. And the other component is that, um, you know, I, the, the type of program that I've been able to set up at Sinai, I know for a fact I couldn't have set up. Um, I, I mean, when I was going into residency, I was deciding between Sinai and Columbia, and I just had a conversation with the Columbia um, chair who was trying really hard to 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 make me go there for residency and and he said you absolutely made the right choice because you would have never been able to do this at columbia so you know i think i think there's so much more than the size and reputation of a place thank you i can the only thing i would add is being involved in consortiums with um all the institutions that you would claim as the greatest, some of the, the most promising young investigators I find um, aren't from them because they have machines and they're given projects. And frankly, the mentor's role for them is diminished and they provide a resource for them and you're providing a lab mentor, but it's not your career that's motivating. And often coming from a smaller space where there's more of a collegial interaction with your mentor, um, allows you early in your career to take ownership of what you have and to move it forward. And so I think the relationships are far more important at your stage than, frankly, being in the big lab. Um, hi there. I'm a lot and I'm a sixth year uh, MD PhD student at Georgetown. Um, and I have two questions that are um, not related. Um, and I want to start off with the mental health awareness issues. Um, so um, we do see that it is becoming more prevalent and more understood that this is a big problem. It's an epidemic. Nature's picking it up. Science is picking it up. JAMA has issues on physician well-being. Um, I'm actually trying to start a national survey on MD-PhD student specific mental health. Um, so my question with that is, what do you see as being, being some of the largest problems that are easily actionable? Um, we need the data to show you know, these institutions that this is a problem, but what are you know easy solutions we can provide to them you know that are easily actionable that can make an immediate impact i know that's a that's a big ask <laughs> with, with three residents in the family i can say that the time the time commitment it is is really um very very difficult so knowing that people have to pass the clinical milestones and you know that that's part of the whole process um, institutions doing something so that if someone actually needs to take a break, needs to take some time, uh, I, I think that's really important. Um, obviously, it's got to be done in the, with the concept that you've still got to meet those milestones at some point, but some flexibility, especially to sort of accommodate work-life balance, is important. I mean, Michael, I don't know whether you have an additional... Well, the sad thing is, as you get older, you have memories of colleagues and stuff who've committed suicide, overdosed. I think, and I can't speak to your world, but in my world of a large children's hospital, the professionalism aspect as how physicians treat with abuse, whether it's drug or depression or, or whatnot, um, has come to highlight. And it's, I mean, I think we have a pretty robust program. And I think the key is, is access to colleagues to go in confidence without having any kind of uh, problems back um, and I don't know how that applies in your situation but once you become faculty or when you look at institutions it's important that they recognize that physicians are under a lot of stress and, and the support systems come from your colleagues um, and so when you're asking me that question the problem is is that you don't live you live in very transitory worlds mm -hmm. our faculty are with us for 20 30 years and we are invested in trying to help them through that process with resources um, but I'm sure if you talk to medical st students in some medical schools, these same things exist. I'm just not aware. Yeah, I don't have anything actionable for you. <laughs> but, um, but, 
you know, the reality is that the competition is getting worse and worse. I mean, I'm sitting now on some admission committees looking at applications going, there's no way I would make it in right now. Um, and, and I don't know how you can deal with that problem because there's just more people that want to do this and there's less spots for people to do this. And, and I think that that causes a tremendous stress. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I don't really have a solution. Um, so I guess the second question is more related than I thought, kind of dealing with work-life balance. So I am fortunate in that I do have a partner who's happy to, oh sorry, I am fortunate in that I do have a partner who would be happy to give up his career and kind of let me do what I need to do. Yeah, fantastic. Stay at home dog dad is what he wants to be. Um, but you know, in the case that you do have, you know, a two career um, partnership, how do you, I, I guess kind of this may be more personal because I'm kind of entering the stage where I would like to start a family. How do you balance or, or start your life when it feels like you need to give everything to your career? And if you're not so fortunate to have, you know, a position where you can kind of really put 100% all your eggs are in, of your, you know, into your career basket, um, how do you, you know, also, also have your personal life and those pr accomplishments that are just as important to you? Mm -hmm. I can start with this one. Um, I really wanted to put in some slides about this, but there was just not enough time. Um, but I can talk about this for an hour. Um, I am married <laughs> um, to a physician scientist. We literally have fights every single day about who's going to, oh, and I also have three children, two going into high school and one going into kindergarten. So, um, so I, I deal with this on a daily basis, and most of our lives are spent uh, literally nickel and diming each other. No, tomorrow you take the kid. No, tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow like it's your turn oh but we talked about this two weeks ago oh, but we didn't put it on the family calendar and so it doesn't <laughs> count um, and and um, in during our internship for both of us we uh, our son was uh, just born uh, two months before um, uh, we started our internship and we went through approximately 50 people that we interviewed or um, hired for for nanny for you know various amounts of time from one day to a couple of months and it was just the most stress stressful stressful thing um, family matters so location in terms of where you live really really matters being close to one family mem member matters so I was lucky enough to have my parents move um, from your from well then Singapore um, to the US um, while I was in the MD PhD program and they live 20 minutes away so they are constantly on call um, and um, <laughs> um, you know it having said that I really want to emphasize that you have to have a personal life. That's where my strength comes from. Um, you know, every time I go home crying from the many punches that I've taken during the last few years, I go home to these beautiful, perfect children. Well, okay, they're not so perfect. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> um, but when they're asleep, they're really perfect, um, which is mostly when I see them. Um, and, and, you know, that everything else kind of melts away. And I want to make one other point, because I'm, I very openly want to support this. Um, I actually, prior to having my third child, um, had told my husband that I want six children. And I'm very serious about that. You know, I'm only halfway through, but I'm very seriously committed to having six children. And so um, we actually froze embryos um, before, you know, in between kids. So before we even had um, our third, who's, you know, naturally uh, conceived. But um, I want to emphasize that to women as a career, in, in careers, as an option, and um, to really really not, because uh, I think there's a stigma against that, um, and, and you don't have to have a partner. The, the uh, freezing process currently for, um, for eggs has actually improved tremendously over the last decade, and so I just you know, want to say that that's an option. I want to say you've got to have multiple backup plans. So, you know, I was very fortunate, but there were times, uh, certainly when we had family issues in the UK and my husband had to, to, to leave. And so, even though it can be hard to find the right people, we actually did always have someone. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually turned out to be many people who worked in labs or that we, that we knew um, in the town, but you, you, sh you always should have another person who can be the backup if the other person cannot be there. And even if you only have one person, have another one that you can get when there's an emergency in the family. Uh, finding the right people is, is, can be a challenge, but I, I think those with um, good radar will often actually find the people that will work well. 
what I tell all my female uh, trainees is life never gets easier mm -hmm. and you have to learn how to balance it. And so if you believe your life is going to be better at any different point, you're just up for, for disappointment. So, so um, don't let the overwhelming situation of the day, you and your spouse, I mean, uh, I always encourage, the lab is an awesome place to have a child, but, but being a busy resident and balancing that is, is what life's about. Um, and don't ever live your life financially or whatever saying, I can do this for two years and then I will be happy, because that's a setup for failure. Mm -hmm. Make sure all your life is in balance and I think you'll make the right choice. Hi, um, thank you for sharing your inspiring career paths and scientific achievements. Um, so I had, I had two questions. Um, first one is for uh, Dr. Dimitriou. Um, you talked about uh, sort of navigating or um, cultivating, creating your own sort of custom residency. Um, and I thought that was really interesting because, you know, as a beginning resident, you really are the lowest on the totem pole in terms of hierarchy. So um, could you just talk about being able to advocate for your own interests and um, what you wanted to get out of residency out of or from a position of relatively um, small amount of power? Um, sure. So um, yeah, internship really sucked. Um, <laughs> um, so the way it was set up was that while I was a resident, I was a resident. Um, I was the same as everybody else. I didn't have any perks. I didn't get to leave early. Um, but post-call, I would go to the lab after 27-hour call. Um, and um, in the lab, I, w I, had, I had a student, and there I was a little bit higher on the totem pole, but, um, <laughs> but not much because she was mostly by herself, so she kind of just did whatever she wanted anyway because I would you know, go back to the clinic. Um, it's, it's hard. Um, I call it the five-year Schrodinger box. Does everybody know what the Schrodinger box was? Okay, so maybe, does anybody not know what the Schrodinger box is? Okay, so it literally was, I did not know if I was alive or dead. And, um, <laughs> and, then, and then my R, R1 score came in and I uh, was so excited that I had opened the door and I was alive that I actually, for the first time in my life, broke out in hives <laughs> um, from excitement, which I didn't know that could happen, but apparently it can. Um, it's hard. It's hard. But if you're passionate about both things that you're doing, you can do it. Sorry, I just wanted to jump on that question um, a little bit. And could you just talk about how you got to the point of actually negotiating that custom path? Mm -hmm. How did that all come together? Yeah, that's actually a, a really important point that I didn't really have time to go into in the presentation. But I really started on that path probably in my first year of the MD-PhD program. I mean, it wasn't something that I sort of came up with in fourth year of med school. It was really something that I cultivated very early on. Um, and luckily, the, the, the MD-PhD director during most of my time in the M M MSCP um, program became the chair of pediatrics. Now, actually, I didn't know I was going to go into pediatrics because like everybody else, I thought I was going to do psychiatry. But it turned out that I didn't want to work on sick people. I wanted to work on healthy people and understanding um, and how to prevent disease. And so it was a little serendipitous um, because she had already known me for a long time. She had cultivated me as a physician scientist, kind of looking to do something outside of the box. Um, and I had already started to discuss with psychiatry for many, many years, sort of in the middle of my MD-PhD program, to do something like this. Um, Mount Sinai had actually done um, similar paths for um, four people in medicine in the past, but nobody in psychiatry or any other residency. Um, so it wasn't sort of completely novel in, in terms of um, Mount Sinai is sort of at the forefront of trying to work on the physician scientist pipe, uh, leaky pipeline. Um, and then when I decided to do pediatrics, um, we started this conversation, um, I guess, early third year of medical school, and we kind of finalized it. Um, before the match. Um, my second 
quick question kind of has to do with the last question that was asked and um, dealing with you know, burnout of people that are spending so much time trying to uh, achieve higher and higher levels of scientific achievement. And um, so there's always more things you could be doing in the lab, at the hospital, more experiments to do, more committees to serve on, whatever. I wonder if you could, um, all of you could talk about the importance of saying no to things uh, professionally that aren't going to uh, make you happier and finding time to pursue your own personal passions that uh, really allow you to spend so much time and effort on your career. So yeah, <clears throat> I'll say that because I said yes way too often at early stages in career. Y you really want to look at a request to do something or even you know a, a thought about doing something as where it's going to take you to the next step. If it's not going to be something that is actually going to add to where you want to be, you should say no and, if you, and, and, and keep on saying no uh, until you have to. The, the second is, I think, it, I, I can't say this more, is everybody should have more than one mentor. So, you know, there are times when a particular mentor will ask somebody to do this, do that. It, you need to have someone you can go and actually consult with and ask somebody who is completely, um, do, doesn't have any skin in the game or, or however way we want to do it. Do you think this is a good idea for me to do this? What would I get out of it? What are the losses that I'll take in terms of what I really want to do? So it's really being thoughtful and then getting advice uh, from other people. So in general, I see administration as a big bowl of jello and that they hold it whatever way they want. And as soon as they leave, it wobbles right back to where it began. Um, and, and I've really pretty much refused going to meetings that don't leave with an actionable item that actually gets done. Um, and so I go when I see that I'm enabling something that I want to do. The best job, frankly, is working for someone that has your mission so you don't have to deal with it. Eventually, you realize your institutional vision is from you, and you have to be able to sell it to use resources to build your programs. But there has to be a return. And if there's no return, it's not worth your time. You'll be asked to be division chairs or head committees with a title or be a head of some committee of some meeting that is not directly related to what you want. It distracts from you if you want people outside to recognize you as opposed to your mission. And I think the truer you stay to your mission, you'll understand how to say no more from the places you don't get in anything back. Um, and I think that's a huge career decision that you need mentors, as Kay said, because what sounds glitzy on the outside consumes you on the inside, and you just have to balance that out. Um, I haven't really been asked to be on many committees yet. I'm actually uh, too early in my career, so I'm just taking notes over here. <laughs> Daniel Barnett, Michigan State University, do PhD student. I want to go back to a comment from the person before the last one here. Uh, Dr. Helmrath, you said that you advise your female students that they need to determine how to balance it. So we had just had a, a session a couple days ago. Do you advise your male students the same thing? Yeah, I, absolutely I do. But they aren't the ones that come to me and ask me about this. So a male student. Um, I'm about 50-50. Um, I don't remember ever sitting down with them with that as a mindset because they're all trying to finish residency and they want pediatric surgery and they feel like if they have a large family. Now, I will, the one exception is Kerry Watson in my lab had two children and he wants to do a bunch of missionary work and he couldn't figure out how to do it and I walked him through how to adopt two kids in the lab. So that's, I guess, counts for males. But that was an overnight taking on that responsibility. But the, mish, the, the comment about living your life today lives very hard. But most of those comments one-on-one -on -one, have been females who either are worried about how they could be competitive to pediatric surgery, which is ridiculously competitive, and would this put them at a, a downside? And, I, and all the comments, so if I, I misspoke, it's just because that's my life experience. But, um, other than Carrie, I don't remember ever having that conversation with the man. Actually, I think it's a really interesting point and something for us to note, too, with our, our 
diversity initiatives because it, you make the very good point that the males don't come to you right when they have these balance issues. If I could ask the audience really quick though, so how many female students have previously been told that they need to determine how to balance things as they try to have a family? How many males in the room have been told the same? So we have a small, small set. I, I think this is an interesting demonstration that in terms of even when males are getting advice, we tend to give that. We had gotten fee feedback from our diversity session that females found this very off-putting that it's very difficult to, to be told you just need to balance it. And that this is more from our side, from our diversity initiatives. We're trying to find ways that we can support females. For our other panelists too, do we, you too, Dr. Helmrath, do you have any suggestions for what we can do systemically, what we can advocate for to try to provide more support to female students, but also male? I, I actually made the point in that session too that for me, when it comes time, my wife and I would like to have kids and somewhere not too in the, the distant future that I expect to take time off when we have kids because she expects me to. Uh, mostly because she is also a, a very educated person that uh, went to graduate school and is working in science. So I would like feedback if we could get some on how we can approach that differently and some of the things we can do as an organization, as APSA, to try to advocate for additional resources to, to support that. So I always say that I only realized I was a woman the moment I stepped into a faculty position because um, I grew up in pretty egalitarian societies. So I first uh, was born in Romania, which actually being communist, so communist was much more egalitarian than here. Um, and then I moved to Sweden, which is, you know, one of the world famous egalitarian countries. And in Sweden, um, either the woman or the man get one year off of work in order to take care of the children and most Swedish couples choose to do one child with one parent and the other child with a different parent. So for me, this conversation was actually very strange and, and I always opted to have my children through the training. I mean, my daughters were two months old when I started the MD-PhD program and my son was two months old when I finished the MD-PhD program. And you know, there's timing that you, you know, I worked on, but, um, but I, uh, I never, I, I mean, I don't understand why my conversation should be different than a, a male's conversation. And I didn't understand that it was different until very recently. Um, I, I, I mean, I think that the laws need to change. I mean, I think that paternity um, leave should be absolutely, I, I don't understand why we don't have it. Um, I also don't understand why I was asked why I want to do such a crazy program when I should just stay home with my son or perhaps do something easier like a postdoc. That was actually a comment that I received at the beginning of this program. Um, I mean, this was a male and um, in retrospect, I should have asked, oh, did you stay home with your two children when you had them? Um, but I mean, to me, it, it, I, I, I find it silly that we're having this conversation, frankly. I just want to uh, point out that NIH is actually looking at this um, and there is a notice that went out which I can send to Audra um, where we made it clear that if people were being funded on these NRSA awards, the T32, the F30, and they encounter um, the need to actually take some time off and family issues are actually right in there, they can actually contact NIH and the program officer and request that they get some additional time in their NRSA. So, um, and this is, this is not, this is actually extending your appointment in that program. Now clearly it may delay your time to degree or whatever, but this is now uh, in there and you can do that and that can be men or women. So I, I want to take a step back because I feel my success came from mentors that treated me like family. Um, my first mentor said that in the lab, if you're working hard, the offspring are females, and if you're goofing around, they're males. Um, and I had a male and a female when I was in her lab of my third and fourth children. But I've always run my lab as a family. It's roughly 15, 18. Um, the trainees are roughly 8 to 10 of the people. And you, you balance that and you recognize people need to come to you and it's recognizable that your, your time issues can be modified based on that. And, and that's not going to be done by an outside person. Those are mentors. And so when you're looking at a lab and you're talking to them, 
Talk to the people who are always there, the PhDs that might, and then the, the people that are training and ask them how the lab accommodates you. If you expect to be there at 8 o'clock every day until 5, that's going to be a problem. Um, and, and some mentors are really micromanaging that way. Others are not. Uh, and I would argue that um, mentors that allow you to accommodate win, too, because your productivity is going to go uh, way up. And that's not male or female. And if I misspoke, it's only because I'm giving you the life experiences uh, that I've had uh, in my own life. I don't want you to feel attacked with the comment. It's, it's, it was more because, it's, as you said it, it was the exact words verbatim that we had gotten feedback in our previous session. So I really wanted to, to do the demonstration right. with the Is group. Thank you all so much for your comments. We really appreciate it. Hi, I'm Lauren Harassmi from the University of Minnesota, and I have sort of a comment and a question. And actually, the comment is directed at our um, just prior question asker. Um, I feel really passionately about gender equality, and I feel a lot of external stress as a female hearing things like, women, we have to figure it out. We have to find the right time. You have to manage your family. Then all that pressure being placed on you and not spread to the male uh, trainees that I see in my programs. And um, one aspect that I've thought a lot about is the idea that's become more prominent with the Me Too issue is that in fighting for gender equality, it can't just be the women, it has to be the men stepping forward to aid in that as well. And there's great programs out there like he for she that help motivate that. And I've never actually experienced um, in a professional setting a male stepping forward like that and advocating for gender issues on behalf of a woman. So thank you so much. That really just made the whole meeting for me. Uh, my question for the panel is about, um, there's a lot of uh, really strong science out there to show that women tend to attribute their successes in life to luck, whereas men tend to attribute it to intrinsic ability. Um, and that filters through to how you see yourself and how you perform in your career. And so I was just wondering, particularly to the female panelists, how you think that might influence your own career and what steps you've taken to battle that, or perhaps it just hasn't been an issue for you, or how you feel about it. It wasn't an issue for me, and, but, but I think going back to what Michael said, and certainly in the context of the presentation I gave, it really depends on the person who's mentoring you. So I, I can't emphasize more um, that in order, to, when, you, when you actually go and interview with a lab, when you think about a choice of a lab, you've really got to find out what that environment is like. And if the environment, if, if there's you know, just one thing that doesn't feel right, it's, it's probably a place you don't want to go. So I just was fortunate with choices. I, I actually, I didn't choose the highest end universities and that, that may be saying something, that actually a place that is really collegial where you have time to grow is also one that could be very valuable. Um. I completely 100% agree with that and I've definitely sort of had some better experiences and some worse experiences and that's really important to keep in mind. Um, but interestingly, because I have this background and I'm from Europe, um, the issue of the intrinsic versus extrinsic is not so much for me. So I've sort of always had a little bit more of the um, male dominant um, attitude. Um, and the reason I'm bringing that up is because actually that's hurt me more than helped me. <laughs> because sort of having that attitude in many cases um, is viewed as much worse um, by male superiors because, you know, a woman is not supposed to be dominant just by, by nature. And so, um, so there, it's a double-edged sword, right? Because the data, yes, clearly shows that, that that's a problem. But then there's other data showing that when women step up and lean in and speak up and sit at the board table, they're looked, uh, they're looked at as, um, you know, pushy or uh, what's the word that people use a lot? Um, bossy. <laughs> so, I mean, I will comment I'm a male, but I, I will tell you, my, my mentors, K1, Susan Henning, others, and people I see who are fantastic, gender neutral, and it may be my training, but, but I will tell you, bar none, when, when making a decision at the end of the day, I always say, who do I trust the most, and it's me. And, and I put it on me to succeed or to fail. And 
and you accept the, what you do and you accept what you don't do and most of what you do in life is a failure. And so if you can't recognize your own failure, um, you can then submit that grant and get it in a pink slip. But it's really an arduous nine months waiting for that. If you can't fail well, and the, the thing that I hear from you, which is problematic, is that I recognize emotional differences between the people in my lab, but I write a lot in red, and I'm not subtle. If it's not good, it's not good. And, and if someone leaves me thinking, and I find out they cry, um, it, it's upsetting to me, but I can't turn off the fact that um, the constructive criticism is meant to get them to where they want to go. And if I tailor that to someone where I'm not as transparent, I'm not mentoring them. So you have to have relationships in one-on-one, -on -one, and over the year, they recognize where your goal is is to help them get through, and you do change it. But I, I have to tell you, as a male, I don't change what I say to a female or, or a male or uh, different, any differently, uh, but I have a track record of having done this enough that, that people generally recognize my intent is, is your own success. And that's where mentors, again, I think are a hugely invaluable uh, source of who you choose to work. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Courtney Campbell. I'm at Ohio State University and currently a cardiology fellow, having gone through the PSTP and MSTP. Um, and I, my question is more on the two-body problem. So um, generally, I know a lot of um, people in my MSTP, a lot of the females also marry physician scientists. And I know that's something you guys have all either mentored people in that process. And I can also have a giant graph of our applying to residency as a dual physician scientist couple, um, but now looking for jobs in that process. So you started to talk about it a little on your last slide. Um, so I was wondering if you could just expand on it, <laughs> on your process, and then how you, other, um, how you both have mentored people through that process as well. So Dr. Harmrat is going to really hate this word that I'm going to use right now because he's trying to take it out she of the says dictionary. Spouse. It's my <laughs> least favorite word. <laughs> We've already had this discussion a little bit, um, but um, having gone through the process, there is absolutely a trailing husband in my case. Um, and the way, and and I also have, um, you know, now that I've interviewed a lot and kind of been all over the country. I've also met very successful couples um, that, that have trailed each other. And it, for the most part, the interesting theme that I've picked up is that people tend to trail each other at different points in their career and go back and forth. I've literally met at least half a dozen to a dozen um, very successful people, like, including chair level, um, that, that have talked about this and how they each trailed um, the other spouse. So for us, the process started with um, the initial, um, the initial uh, setup that we had was that he was going to interview first, and um, he would pull me in. Um, and that uh, worked for a couple of interviews, but not offers. And so uh, sort of later in the fall, um, I started applying with the thought that I would pull him in. And it seems to be working, but um, perhaps not perfectly, because um, he may need to actually give up the science part for a little bit and, and go more the clinical route. So I'm still right in the middle of the thick of this, um, and it's very, very painful. Having said that, you know, as a family, you make it work, right? So, you know, we had a lot of honest conversations, um, and being that my science is currently at a more advanced level than his, he's okay with supporting that um, for, the, for the near future with the thought that I will support his um, later on when, when it, you know, for me it's a little bit easier. Um, but it's, it's a real tough problem. And um, now I will turn it over for him to EV Alive. Well, so we, we had the opportunity to talk on the phone a while. And, and I think what Danny's saying is right. I think my perspective of hiring a lot of people, recruiting a lot of people, being involved in putting together their packages, is that, well, I want them to come and succeed. And it's really important early on and identify 
And when my HR uses the word trailing spouse, I hate it. Because to me, it's, it's the individual's family that you want to recruit and you want them to be happy. And so the earlier I understand what would be. So if I were recruiting Danny and I understood these, I would go back to understanding that he has to be a master of what he's studying. And being, understanding your disease is key to being successful as an MD, PhD. And so understanding the depth of your disease really will enhance your your research side. So it's not bad to start a clinical side of what you're doing because you could always translate from either direction. That's a circle. So that's as long as you're in the field that you're interested in and you're building information, you can be successful if you're resourced. Um, my job is to resource both the recruiter and their spouse. Um, and if they don't tell me, so I've recruited pay people, I don't know anything. Two years they're frustrated because they, want, they love their job, their spouse is unhappy and they've never come to us. And I don't want to lose someone three years into a process because I didn't know that their spouse was not placed in a position. So I think you do have to approach it like Danny, whereas you have to have someone want you first. And maybe that's not a dual thing. I don't know because everyone I'm recruiting, I already want. And then I want to listen to. But if you can't share that along the way, people can't help you. And so that's not a secret. And once you're starting to be recruited and you have a spouse, you've got to bring them into the conversation, in my opinion. Since I have um, three residents in the family, you really have to have a conversation uh, ahead of the beginning of the application process as you're thinking about where you're going to go for the next step, about what can work for each of you. And it may be that one person can't be in a research intensive position for a time, but doing the clinical part is going to be okay. Um, but you really have to have, the, the, the couple has to have an agreement as to what is going to work for them or not so that you don't actually go somewhere and think, oh, I only came here because I had to follow my husband or my wife. Uh, you, you've got to be ready to do it. Okay, last question, because we're almost out of time. Go Thank ahead. you. Uh, this has been a wonderful panel, and I really appreciate all the comments and questions so far. Uh, my name is Warren McGee. I'm an MD-PhD student at Northwestern, hopefully wrapping up my PhD this year, fingers crossed. Um, I've had discussions with early stage um, faculty members about the challenges of balancing their clinical responsibilities and their research responsibilities, and especially around the discussion of RVUs. Um, so I know everybody up there probably knows what those are. Um, for the audience, those are a way that hospitals and healthcare professionals um, quantify how much money a uh, particular medical service is, and that that tends to emphasize procedures over out outcomes. Um, and I'm wondering, because you, we have somebody who's in the thick of being an early stage investigator, somebody who's running a department, and somebody at the NIH, um, if you have any thoughts and perspectives as that or other barriers with the system for us to have the flexibility to craft the career that we would want. So that's a great, that's the question I was expecting. <laughs> so I, I think the most important first job is the job that you're being brought in to grow your academia and not to fill clinical spaces. So for surgeons, they make far more money in the operating room than they do in the lab. And when division chiefs and stuff want to hire a young faculty that wants some protected time, um, they want to know when is that going to break even, when they get a grant, where is it going to fill. And at the end of the day, for a clinician who's especially a surgeon, research is not going to pay the bills. Uh, and it's not measurable. There's no academic RVU out there. And so you have to look at how a structured uh, program is or what your clinical division looks like to say, am I being brought in because they need man work and they're going to offset that by giving me an opportunity to do research. That's not career building. Um, you need to have that uh, commitment. And most of the packages I help people negotiate, I'm more worried not about their initial package. I'm worried about their three to five year package, what the expectations are. And it's really scary when they don't have a, a, a division chief that knows what to expect along the way um, to understand where you're converting from K's to R's. So I left Texas because although I had R01s, I didn't have infrastructure and support to do what I wanted to do. It was, I, I was, loved the place I had to move. 
at North Carolina had to move to Cincinnati because they didn't know how to build uh, clinical programs that it attracted kids from around the world, which is what I do. So there was limitations to, the, uh, to where I was at. Um, so when, when you go and negotiate your first job, um, it's not about RVUs, it's about the perception of where your role is in and what you'll be recognized for um, to balance. And if you're the only researcher and they expect you to have an R01 and pay for 50% of your salary um, and you're a surgeon, you're not going to be happy. Uh, so those are all things you have to, to think about along the way. I completely concur with all of that. The one piece that I would add is that it's also important as a physician scientist to really consider um, the field that you're going into very carefully and differently than, than perhaps somebody who's just doing um, planning on doing residency and not research. So for example, for me, um, as a pediatrician, my RVUs really don't matter because literally I can't, I would make less money if I started out as a full-time pediatrician than if I started out as a full-time uh, neuroscientist. So, so for me, that, that conversation, I mean, when I have conversations right now in terms of um, trying to decide how much clinic time I'm going to have, most chairs are actually wanting me to do less uh, and are pushing for me to do 10% and only a few places are pushing for me to do 20 or 25% because they're not really going to make money off of me. Um, so I, I think that that's also an important component because you can't quite think as, as uh, you know, uh, towards the end of the md -PhD program, you're just in medical school and, and you can't just think of that component in terms of what you love. Um, uh, you, you need to, to consider both. Yeah, I'll just say negotiate. And you really, when you're looking at the next position, you've got to ask for probably more than you are willing to settle with. And don't settle for something that's not going to give you the time to do what you want to do. OK, I think that concludes our session today. I really want to thank all of you for your very thoughtful questions and our panelists today for being so open and real in their responses. I hope you will have several takeaways from this session and hopefully you gained a lot of advice to think about in your training and careers going forward as well as your lives. So thank you again, everyone.